you know, I still had to run my dojo. People were looking up to me and relying on me. And I would come in and I'd be like this butterfly floating and not really feeling into what are the needs of other people and not being able to fulfill them. I would be kind of giving half ass lessons, being all happy about myself. You know, in a way, it's almost arrogant. You know, it's almost self-centered. It's all about me feeling good about myself. Hey, Tribe of Journey Men, women. So uh, I'm sitting here, actually just recorded an episode beforehand. And uh, I thought, you know, should I record one more? And this one is one which I kept thinking about. And I kept remembering this story and I kept thinking, I felt, I, I felt this intuitive feeling that I just need to share it, you know, that there's probably going to be something value in it. Uh, but there was also a bit of a hesitation in me there uh, before recording it. And I thought, like, should I do it? Should I not? And I said, you know what? Let's do it. So I'm going to tell you this story, uh, which is quite a fascinating one, but it's kind of a bit of a chaotic one. Usually I, I like to tell stories which I'm, you know, I kind of have well figured out in my brain and my mind and I told him told it many times but this one now that I think about it back I probably didn't speak much about this one maybe a couple of times and the story is of a time that I actually meditated way too much and I'll probably actually now that I think of it I'll, I'll bring up a number of stories related to it like the times I overdid it because that's actually kind of my character I'm an either all or nothing guy. I, if I do something, I do something 100%. Sometimes it works for my, to my favor. Sometimes it works against my favor. There's good and bad. So, so actually that's already a valuable look, thing to look at, especially if somebody of some of you have that same thing. But anyway, so let's focus on meditation and a quick intro to my background to make sure you know that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I practiced, started practicing meditation super early. I think I was maybe like 11, 12 years old, maybe 10, when I saw an episode. Oh, that's a loud car. So I saw an episode of Dragon Ball uh, where uh, young Sun Goku was meditating. And I really liked that idea of calming down your mind, being still like the sky. There was a quote there. And actually at that day, I also had nightmares. I also had really bad nightmares, like like night terrors, I believe, a lot. And uh, somehow intuitively, I, I had that sense and feeling that if I will meditate, that will help me uh, overcome that. And it did, actually did. And it just made me calmer and, and more composed. Even at a young age like that, 11 years old or so, I kind of felt and realized that it's, it's useful. And also probably to it helped that, you know, I would see... I was always inspired by, uh, or in the past I was inspired by Eastern culture, you know, like figures like Samurai Jack or uh, just Samurai in general. And, and oftentimes you would see meditation in those, you know, stories, narratives, like how a powerful Samurai or warrior is meditating. And there was always this clue that, you know, meditation will lead you to become more powerful. And so I think all of that kind of drew me in to meditate. And so... Long story short, uh, I started meditating early on and then I kept digging into meditation and I kept meeting uh, like people like Buddhist teachers and like at a young age, I was maybe like 14 or 15, I was really looking for answers and that priests and monks and uh, spiritual teachers and, and I kept trying to figure out, you know, how meditation works. So I'm pretty sure I will talk more about that in other episodes and there's some of you asking me about what meditation I practice and I'm planning to definitely talk about that how I enter how I integrate meditation like no bullshit meditation into my life the no woo woo meditation uh, but for some reason I just felt I need to tell this story before I get more technical uh, so this story actually takes us way forward uh, passing through me living in a spiritual martial arts school for a few years, meditating, meditating there a lot. We would do like meditation retreats and you know, sometimes meditate like for hours and hours. And uh, also eventually I opened out my own Aikido slash you know, martial arts yoga school, meditation school. So I was constantly teaching people to meditate and I was meditating all the time myself. But there's a, there was a significant moment during me running my Aikido school 
uh, it was the last years, maybe a couple years before I closed it. I closed my Aikido school after seven years of running it, so maybe five, six years into it. Um, I think, you know, I thing is, and I kept repeating this, but but it's the truth. I always felt inspired to inspire other people, and I always wanted to make like a positive, powerful impact on other people's lives. And that gave, I realized early enough uh, through exploring it and going on my journey that you need to have a lot in yourself. You need to know as much as you can, uh, be as good of a human being as you can be in order to have value in you so you can provide value to others. Uh, so you need to kind of, you kind of need to excel at how you are in order to give to others. And at that moment, I really, I did meditation already for a long time, but at that particular moment, I felt like I need to push things. And I got really inspired about Advaita Vedanta. It's something I mentioned in a few episodes, but never dug into. Advaita Vedanta means non dualistic, non-duality, non I think. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it's non-dualistic teaching. That, uh, to give you a quick summary of what that is, it's, uh, in my understanding, the way I understand it, and I spend a lot of time investigating and, and practicing Advaita Vedanta, it's uh, the, you're seeking to realize you're not your body. Uh, that's kind of one of the parts, but but the, that even goes deeper. You, 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 you go into pursuit aiming to perceive that even this reality is kind of not real. That's what most Advaita Vedanta teachers would kind of show and they would be kind of like Ramana Maharshi, probably one of the most famous Advaita Vedanta guys. He was, uh, he got enlightened very early when he was 14, but he was so deep in his kind of Nirvana bl blissful state that he was sitting at this uh, mountain called Arunachala like a sacred mountain in the south of India. It's still, it's still there. The whole ashram to Raman Maharshi stands there, dedicated to him. Uh, but back then the ashram wasn't there and he was just sitting there meditating and he was so deep in the non-dual state that apparently based to this, this, his story, uh, bugs started making nests in between his thighs, inside of his thighs. And they started feasting off of his thighs. They started eating it and biting it all the time and he didn't care he was so deep in that non-dual state and he didn't care about his body because basically that's kind of what Advaita Vedantists are aiming for is to realize that kind of and I don't want to misguide you it's not like the way I perceive it it's not like a negative negative thing it's not like uh, nihilistic I guess although I don't know that much about nihilism but basically uh, you're in that state where you want to figure out that you know this this is all just a perception and and you don't exist as an individual so who the fuck cares it's like you know i don't give a fuck all that matters i'm just in this blissful state of oneness and nothing really exists so i might as well just sit here and you know enjoy the experience something like that you know i could you know i'm i'm, I'm not being so clear about it but that's kind of the image you can that's the image kind of i developed years of my training simplified hardcore simplified so he was kind of in that state and he didn't give a fuck about his body and but then people started to recognize that he's a saint and he's enlightened and they started taking care of him but apparently based on the story the the parts of his legs uh, where uh, uh, there were scars till the end of his life because of how he didn't care about those bugs but for the rest of his life he was like that his body he looks a bit like a cripple all the time because he from what I understand, he would barely move. You know, he would mostly just sit there and sometimes people would ask him questions, he would answer questions, but he didn't care at all. I mean, about, you know, sustaining a life, getting a profession or whatever. He was always in that non-dual state. He wouldn't identify himself as an individual. I guess it would be more uh, ident identification of uh, the consciousness moving through him. And so if you look at his pictures, he's always cool, chill, kind of a bit spaced out or tuned in like it's, it's hard to say but the pictures are in our office it's very beautiful like you see his eyes glittering he, he looks like a cool guy actually but then yeah he didn't give a fuck about his body and uh i at that particular life i always was interested in Advaita Vedanta i always saw it as a tool valuable tool to gain 
but I was never like completely lost in it. But I can't honestly remember what exactly made me dive into it like head in. Uh, it might have been the fact that I read the book uh, of about uh, Ramakrishna, uh, the greatest saint uh, before Ramana Maharshi of the previous century before him, who was also, he wasn't really like a full on Advaita Vedanta guy, although he did learn Advaita Vedanta from uh, one of the top guys of uh, the day of Advaita Vedanta. He kind of even surpassed him. It's a funny story about that, how it happened, but I don't know if it's going to come up in this episode or not. But, but he was more, he was like a mix of everything. He wasn't like, he was a devotee of Kali, but he was kind of a mixed bag. But Advaita Vedanta was familiar to him and he didn't like, he didn't, he wasn't concerned about like a regular lifestyle either. Uh, he was very much like always being in that blissful state. And I think something about that attracted me. I think I was also reading, uh, how is that, Muji, a Western enlightened guy who was very popular at the day, became popular. Uh, and he was all about kind of being in a blissful state too, like a light version of Advaita Vedanta. Man, I'm giving you a lot of names, but for some reason I feel like I'm telling them. So the, the lineage actually was the same. So, so one of the top students of Ramana Maharshi was Papaji, very well-known spiritual teacher. And then uh, Muji was a student of Papaji. So, you know, it was a clear, actually, it was a, a Desi, it was descendant of Ramana Maharshi, but he was kind of like more laid back version, more Western version of him. Uh, but, but still basically Advaita Vedanta. And I was reading that to him too. And, I kind of like what liked his te teachings, and I think probably something. It's it's funny. I usually have a very good memory, but I can't put a point a finger on why specifically. Like, what was the main cause of me really diving head in into Vedanta Vedanta at that period of my life? But my best guess is probably I just came to a conclusion that I need this in order to be more valuable to humanity. I was still an Aikido instructor, and I felt like. My ego was getting in the way, I guess. And then if I will become a vessel to life, it's kind of one of the existing ideas of spirituality, is that you need to, it kind of direct you to disassociate yourself from the identity, to dissolve your ego, and to just let life or universe work through you. Like, you know, leave no ego bits and pieces. And I kind of thought, okay, man, if I do this, I will be really useful to humanity. I will provide a lot of value. That was always important for me, it still is. And as soon as I come to a conclusion that this is going to be good, I usually head, uh, dive head into it. So before I start telling you how that worked out for me, let's drink some coffee. Two, actually. Let's check the microphone before bastard motorcycles disturb my audio. All good. So, uh, that's what I did. Funny enough, also to use an important point to mention, at that day, I was still married. I, I'm divorced now, but I was still married to my partner. Uh, we were having bumps and bruises in our relationship, but to, I mean, no wonder. I mean, we got divorced, but but the, but she on certain levels she was supportive of uh, to me, uh, which I pre always appreciated. She gave me the space to explore. Uh, sometimes, yeah, it's a long story, <laughs> worth another video. But but so she gave me kind of the, the space to explore, or maybe. Now that I look back, I think, could it be that we were actually separating already? Like we were kind of on and off and living on, living separately. Could be that I'm kind of mixing in. You know, it's actually funny too. I think part of the reason I'm mixing this up is because that's something I'm going to talk about right now is I, I, I spend so much time being in that zero state, which I call the zero state. And it's something I, I will bring up later as well. A very important key concept in meditation for me, in my practice. The zero state is basically a complete state of peacefulness, of rest, where you're completely disengaging from your story. And your story, I mean, your job, your career, your relationship, your finances, your even your name, your age, you completely disassociate from everything. You're just in the state of this moment. 
and to kind of because it's an important part of the story i'll give you a bit of a glimpse of what that is so you could feel into it so basically uh if you look at this moment your name doesn't exist in this moment without the past and the future basically the past you know you were given that name and you came to a decision that this is your name you know initially kids are like they're going around and they, they speak about themselves in third person and then the parents are like no this is you your name is Rokas, and then they start to refer themselves. Rokas wants to pee, and they're like, "No, I am Rokas," and you know, and you go through that process, and then you decide, "Okay, I am Rokas," but it's an, you inherit that, and it's a valuable tool. I'm, I'm not saying you know dissociate yourself from that, but uh, but in the zero state, if you let go of the past in that moment consciously, you just leave the past be. Your name pretty much doesn't exist to a degree your your problems don't exist and this is a very interesting question actually to ask yourself it's a question i would sometimes bring up to my meditation students or yoga students um, i'll ask you this as well so in this moment what is, could identify and tell me a problem which exists in without a relationship to past or future so i'll repeat it again identify a problem which exists in your life which is not related to the past or the future so let you think for a moment, drink some coffee. Probably you're having a hard time finding one. There are a few you could name like, oh, my knee hurts, it's cold, but usually all, all problems will be, oh no, tomorrow I will need to pay my taxes or even like today I will need to pay your taxes, but today is later. You know, right now in this moment, it's an idea that you need to pay your taxes. Literally you're not like, if you disassociate from the future, taxes don't exist. I'm not saying don't pay taxes. That's not the message. It's just kind of the perspective, your relationship to it, that if you're completely in this moment, then uh, the past and the future don't really function. And even like if you were saying I'm cold, cold to a degree is a sensation. The problem is that you will get sick, you know, or you will feel uncomfortable later the, the more colder you get. But if you're focused on just this moment, even cold is not a problem. Or even pain is not a problem. Pain is the pro problem. Pain is just a sensation. The problem it becomes the more you think about the future and how your life is going to suck if you're going to be constantly in pain. So you do something about it. But basically my message is, in this moment, if you release the story, pretty much problems don't exist. Barely anything exists. But consciousness, perception still exists. You hear things. You feel things. And, and actually, it's, it's an interesting moment is that if you let yourself dive into that and let go of the past and the future, which I'm kind of doing with myself right now, uh, and you become connected to this moment, aware of this moment, you're, because otherwise we're constantly in our head, projecting the future, guessing what's going to happen, trying to understand what happened before. And that's kind of a burden. It always stimulates us. But if you let go of that, there's very little that stimulates you. It's, it's just light sensations, you know, like sounds and, and experience. And if you let yourself go into that kind of a sense of peace and restfulness comes up, actually a sense of happiness. I will make a different episode about that, but actually that's like when I was pursuing of trying to understand what happiness is, that, that was my answer. You know, happiness is usually in being in this moment. Long story, I'll cover it later. But hopefully now you're trying to start to see what I'm talking about, and that is what I call the zero state. I usually point out two more states. I, I might cover them more in different episodes. But let's focus on the zero state, right? So Ramana Maharshi, uh, Ramakrishna, were all about the zero state. Muji as well, to a degree, I mean, sometimes maybe they would expand out of it to, to be more accessible to Westerners because we're all about the second state, the, two, the, the state of two where we're creating and establishing and, and you know, overcoming stuff, which is an important state as well. But at that day, I made a mistake of disregarding the state of two and I, I started to associate it as bad. And I started to feel like it's all about the zero state and one state. The state of one is where you're engaging, you're acting, but your engagement is very uh, and very light. Let's say you're washing dishes and all your attention is in the dishwashing. 
you know, you're kind of acting in this moment. So I would kind of allow myself a bit of that, but, but I was all about the zero state. So, so I would try to, f like even daily, like in, uh, in very regular situations, I would always try to focus my mind, not on the story. I would kind of try to ditch the story entirely, forget my story, my personal story, and fully focus only on this moment all the time. It was a constant effort, a constant training, a constant kind of, point of focus and I would meditate as much as I can like every chance I would get I would meditate and I'm waiting and I still do this practice a bit again subject for another video but let's say I'm you know waiting for someone uh, who's late I don't wait I sit there and I just either meditate in the state of one just you know feeling into what's happening or I completely shut off and just you know let the moment absorb me uh, but then I would do it all the time. So, you know, I'm making food, food is cooking. I'm not waiting for food. I'm going into a state of zero. You know, I, I didn't watch TV. I didn't use my computer. I was in the state of zero. So I would do it all the time. I was meditating all the time. And even I, I made this, uh, kind of, a journey for myself per se. I decided to shut myself off for, for a full weekend from Friday afternoon till Monday afternoon, I shut off Wi-Fi, I shut off uh, my electricity, like I shut off everything. Mobile phone, I announced to everyone that I will not be accessible during this time. And, and I decided to not use any electricity at all and to pretty much not use anything and just to completely be in the state of zero as much as I can and go out of it as little as I can. So just go to the bathroom, maybe read some spiritual books, and make some food when I have to. And I also even shut down clocks and watches so I wouldn't know the time. And I was always in that state. So, so I was really like, for a few weeks, I was really heavily into it. And now the, the, the key moment of the subject, the lesson I learned. Well, let me first of all tell you, it was a disaster. And I'll tell you why. And I think it happens to all of the people who focus too much on the state of zero and who want to be too spiritual. The thing is, when you're in the state of zero, uh, problems don't exist for you, right? Kind of like how I try to bring you into that practice of the state of zero right now, forgetting about the past, forgetting about the future. Problems don't really exist in that moment. But it doesn't mean your problems disappear in the greater scheme of society. Your problems do not disappear for your wife, for your husband, for your children. You know, your taxes don't go away. And you can kind of just try to swim through and be on, on the current, on the wave, and kind of pass through in that zero state and expect everything to work itself out. And sometimes it does, but still, I think eventually I came to a conclusion it's not fair. Because when I was practicing that state, and with my now ex-wife, we were, she would come to me and she would bring me up some problems. She's like, oh, look, Brokos, you, you didn't do this. I'd be like... I'd be so much deep in my zero state that I was like, what's the problem? You know, why are you upset about this? You know, it's like, like, why are you wasting your energy? You know, it's like, and I, and, and the thing is, you know, it would, she would get really frustrated and, and to some degree it sounds cool. Now it sounds like, oh, he's so spiritual, you know, and he doesn't have problems. It's awesome. I wish I wouldn't have problems like that. But my final conclusion is it's disrespectful. It, you cannot really conduct a good relationship like that. A relationship for me is, the whole life is, is a mix of conflict and, uh, and peace. I think that's why you need to balance, that was my main lesson, that you need to balance the state, of, the state of zero and the state of one and two. That's a crucial way of, that's my main way of how I practice and perceive meditation these days. It's a balance of all things. And if you disregard the two and one, yeah, you can be that guru guy, you know, sitting there smiling and being happy for yourself. But then you can't expect, first of all, you can't expect everyone else to go down that same rabbit hole with you. The life is still continuing and there's a lot of shit happening in the world. Like, you know, if, if, we, if we dig down deep, you know, not that I'm capable of tackling that yet myself, but, you know, there's, there's sex trafficking. And there are people who are addicted to drugs. And then there are 
know, there's war, there's famish and uh, famine. You know, there are, there are violent crimes around. There are men who are beating their wives and, and there are children who are being abused, let alone, you know, talk about sexually. There's a lot of injustice. And then I'm in that peaceful state and, and that's kind of the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. It's like, oh, it's all a dream. Fuck it, don't care. But then how do you tell that to a child, you know, who's being molested at the moment? You know, do you come to him and say, oh, your problem does not exist? And there is a chance that, you know, there are stories like where prisoners get enlightened. You know, they realize that prison is, is just an idea and and they forget their crime and so on and so forth. And you can kind of maybe help a person heal to a degree from past trauma in this way. But, but at the same time, I think it's unfair. I just personally think it's unfair. It's unfair to take your state of peacefulness, your non-existence of problems, and just throw it on, to, on others and expect others to become enlightened as well. I don't think the world is supposed to work that way. I think conflict is beautiful. I think part of life's part of life's interest is the journey, is you know overcoming obstacles and overcoming challenges and solving problems. The problem is if you're too much in the state of fear, if you're always in the state of fear and you're not able to turn off and you're not able to be in the state of zero, sometimes then yes, you're fucked, and most people are fucked. And sometimes I slip and need to remind myself Rokas you're too much in the state of two come on man chill a bit because then happiness and joy and appreciation is in the state of zero it's really difficult to appreciate things and be happy in the state of two because you, the state of two is all about problems it's all about fuck there's so much wrong and you can do something about this but then and you can be useful in it but then you're also burning yourself out and you're not also enjoying life and you're not recharging yourself to keep on going so it's important that you recharge but i think people are you know people are too divided and and people are too focused on one or the other i was definitely you know there were moments where i was too focused on the two and i burnt myself out and i wasn't so much useful anymore because i was too burnt out and then i was for too long in the state of zero and then uh, and then i would be fucked because you know, I still had to run my dojo. People were looking up to me and relying on me. And I would come in and I'd be like this butterfly floating and not really feeling into what are the needs of other people and not being able to fulfill them. I would be kind of giving half half lessons, being all happy about myself. You know, in a way, it's kind of almost, almost arrogant. You know, it's almost self-centered. It's all about me feeling good about myself. Fuck that. It's fucked up. And that's kind of what I realized at that moment. I think maybe my relationship problems started to kind of get to me and I started asking myself, I saw my ex-wife suffering from me being, you know, this spiritual douchebag, you know, all without problems, all enlightened and happy. And part of me was kind of starting to bug me and say to me like, dude, she's suffering, you know? And who the fuck cares that you're in this blissful state and you're happy, but it doesn't make her problems go away. And again, you could be a spiritual douchebag and say, oh no, you know, it's her, you know, she, through this hardship, she will become enlightened and she will see you're happy, so happy, she's going to let go of problems. But again, I think it's unfair. Feel free to have a different opinion, but I've been in this spiritual shit world for a long time, really devoted, and... I'm not in a blissful state all the time now, especially these days when I'm starting this new journey and I really want to have great impact on the world, like positive impact. Sometimes I allow myself to stay in the state of two for longer and I do burn myself out sometimes. Like, then I catch myself and I'm like, oh, focus, chill, you know, add some state of zero practice in your life. But, but at the same time, I'm very happy. And that happiness is different. It's not just blissful, Yes, the world is amazing and everything is great, but it's a mix. It's a mix of, I'm so happy, part of me is so happy about, you know, facing this challenge. Part of me is so happy that, you know, kind of I'm looking back at these difficult experiences and traumas in a way and kind of 
revisiting them and and selling them and sharing them and you know I'm, I'm very happy when I get some comments who appreciate these stories and I feel like okay I'm, I am fulfilling my purpose bit by bit you know, and sometimes I do get down and get demotivated by the challenges if they're too big at, at certain moments and you're not I'm not like super happy I'm like all oh, blissful peace man but then I recover and then I stop and I appreciate and I'm like holy crap this is amazing you know, I have a wonderful girlfriend wonderful dog weather is beautiful coffee's good I have a chance to contribute to this world you know we have so much to be honest you know we have electricity we have food most of us do not everyone but that's the point not everyone has everything not everyone has as much as we do and if we are privileged to have it all it doesn't mean you know we should forget others if we're enlightened it doesn't mean we should expect others to get enlightened and i think that's kind of the point of buddha siddhartha gautama the first buddha where uh, you know he got enlightened and and that's he, he was given the opportunity the chance to become a bodhisattva which in my understanding means he could have stayed in the blissful state and just fucked it all, be an Advaita Vedanta, or he he could choose and he became a bodhisattva, a person who's enlightened but still goes around and helps others. But let's make it more simple. Let's not, you know, talk big about enlightenment. Let's just say, you know, be happy with your own life, but then accept that others are suffering and go out there and do something about it. And enjoy your life once in a while, but also solve problems. That's the main message. That's the goal of the journey of this channel is to inspire more people to live that way. Because I think that's an awesome way to live. I think some, some people would enjoy living like that. Sometimes stopping and appreciating your life and sometimes saying, fuck, fuck this. I need to do something about this and not wait for everyone to become enlightened and not just pretend that enlightenment is the ultimate solution. I don't think it is. I think the balance is the point.